very good morning a very good afternoon and a very good evening to all those who have joined us uh, here at a panel on connecting culture and nature knowledge i abhyantiwari on behalf of the partners uh, on behalf of ccp on behalf of ikrom and on behalf of my co moderator eugene jo invite you all to this interesting panel uh, as some of you might know that we initially had uh, six speakers speaking on this panel but unfortunately covid had to play its role and now we have four speakers but we still have a good line of speakers uh, uh, and very uh, interesting presentations to make uh, before uh, i introduce my speakers let me introduce uh, my co moderator who is uh, ms eugene jo uh, She's a program manager at World Heritage Leadership uh, in Ekro. Uh, she joined Ekro in 2017 and is based in Rome. Uh, welcome, Eugene Jo. Okay, let me invite my first speaker and introducer, uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole Franceschini. Uh, she's an online activity coordinator at World Heritage Leadership Program. She has a BA in Cultural Heritage. with a major in archaeology and MA in world heritage studies between 2016 to 2021 she worked as a lecturer at uh, in world heritage and heritage management at BTU german uh, nicole will be speaking about uh, nature culture solutions working together to strengthen the resilience of heritage places uh, without any further delay let me hand it over to nicole uh, one quick thing after each uh presentation will be having the question answers for that particular speaker so you may please share your question in the chat box itself and we'll pick it uh, from there uh nicole over to you thank you thank you avyan good morning good afternoon everyone this is very much a pleasure for us to be here today i speak for us because i am here representing more than one person this is actually a collective work that um myself maya shizawa and yujin jo have been carried on on behalf of three organizations that are involved in the panorama nature culture thematic communities which is icomos ikrom and iucn so i am here today to briefly introduce you to the panorama nature culture community and um to actually invite many of you to join us in this uh, adventure Uh, the panorama nature culture thematic community is an online based tool that empowers site manager management teams heritage institutions communities researchers and other heritage professionals to share their work and experiences and at the same time the platform offers a chance to learn from one another as i had already said this is a joint effort this is a community that is jointly coordinated by ecomos ecrom and iucn and it brings together practitioners from both the natural and the cultural heritage sector to share management and conservation challenges as well as strategies in a mean of creating a community that can learn from one another learning about possible solutions that have been applied somewhere else learning about case studies of what other people are doing as a way of peer learning and enhancing our global both cultural and natural heritage efforts and as i said this is very much a way that wants us to work towards creating a global and integrated community of practices as well as to foster the establishment of more cross sectoral and multidisciplinary heritage sector that in this case also go beyond heritage designation and for us because panorama nature culture has also have a strong focus on world heritage also to go beyond world heritage properties the panorama nature culture is born to address issues um that are find at the policy and at the research and practice level but 
the one important thing is that the way we address these issues is not by doing it alone, but we're actually part of a wider partnership that operates under the umbrella of a broader platform that is called Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet. And this broader partnership initiative is led by IUCN and GIZ, but it also involves 10 international organizations that operate in the field of conservation, of development, and international cooperation. Among these, we can see, for example, the World Bank Group. We do work with Great Arendelle, the UN Environmental Program, and others. And the platform really promotes sustainable development through work and experience on the ground through nine thematic communities, so through nine different main themes and possibly a couple more themes that will be coming in 2022. And I will be shortly talking about um, some of our colleagues working on different themes that are not specifically nature culture related. The aim of Panorama is to document and promote inspiring and replicable solution across a range of conservation and sustainable development topics, enabling cross-sectoral learning and inspiration. The key of the platform is to foster peer learning by allowing practitioners to share and reflect on their work and experiences. And it also allows for an increased recognition of successful work, offering a worldwide framework, framework for showcasing diverse approaches put in place to deal with common challenges around the world. At times, when we also look at case studies, there is a strong focus on highlighting the many things that don't work and deep key of the Panorama platform is actually to focus on approaches that have worked on the ground and showcasing these experiences. And Panorama documents these case studies as solutions. In fact, if you access the Panorama link that I have posted in chat and that will be shared also via other channels, you will see that we're not talking about case studies, but we are talking about solutions that are uploaded on the Panorama platform through a standardized format that focuses on identifying those replicable approaches, elements, and arrangements that are the key success factor of a solution that has been applied to a place. And you will also see that every solution tries to provide a little bit more information on the context in which these solutions have been put in place. If we want to look at the panorama uh, process, it's fairly straightforward. On the planet, on the work we do as heritage professionals, both in the natural and cultural sector, we do have people that have experiences to share, that they have po positive experiences to share, and those are the solution providers, those people that share their work, they share their experiences by uploading them on Panorama. And these solutions are usually then reviewed by an internal panel made by peers, but also practitioners coming from the wider field and then hosted within a portal. And in our case, this portal will be nature culture, coming also in a minute to tell you a little bit more why we talk about the nature culture portals. On the other hand, there are solution seekers, which are the many of us that are actually looking at how to improve things at our heritage places, how to do things differently, how to overcome some challenges, and they access the portal to find out about what's happening in a different place and what are the solutions being applied elsewhere. And here, as I already said, talking about the nature culture thematic community, why did we start um, talking about it? And why did we feel there was the need to talk about nature culture and to create a global network of solutions tackling nature culture specifically? And here it comes from the fact that um, Panorama Nature Culture really addresses a series of issues and challenges that have been found at different level, at the policy level, at the research level, and at the practice level in the wider heritage field, as well as in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention specifically. As some of you might know, the World Heritage Convention is a unique tool that brings together natural and cultural heritage under the same umbrella, but as Similarly to many national and regional heritage frameworks, natural and cultural heritage are defined separately. And often this separate definition of nature and cultural heritage perpetrates a nature cultural divide that not necessarily exists at the local level, particularly where indigenous people and local communities have multiple and diverse worldview and do not acknowledge the separation of nature and culture. So it's important to say that 
nature as a separate entity as existing of its own is not a norm. And in many places, we do have people that do not acknowledge this Western naturalist ontology. Hence, what the nature culture community, but also the work that Ikram, Ikomos, and IUCN are doing is an understanding of the fact that policies should be embedded in local experiences and they should be created through bottom-up approaches. And for this reason, there is the need to collect more data and evidence. And here comes the importance of understanding experiences that are applied in different places, but also collect them and exchange within a wider community. At the same time, this nature culture divide is often perpetrated also between research and practice, as well as between different disciplinary and sectorial backgrounds of professionals and institutions that work in heritage conservation. We do need to foster interdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary cooperation, and cross-sectoral exchanges to better understand heritage in a more holistic manner. And in light of all of this, the Panorama Nature Culture documents those nature culture practices on the ground in order to provide evidence for policy making towards interconnecting natural and cultural heritage sector and embed heritage into the larger sustainable development framework. Nature culture solution present people centered and praise praise approaches to integrated management of heritage places, including both natural and cultural values. And nature culture solution come from places where these interlinkages between nature conservation and the safeguarding of cultural heritage are crucial for the effective management and the sustainable development of heritage places, benefiting both the heritage place, but also its people and communities. And the nature culture thematic community offers a wide range of solutions and you will see on the platform if you click on the link that is available in chat we do have already more than 350 solutions and this solution really offers a wide range of nature culture integrated place-based and people-centered approaches to heritage they come from a diverse context by exploring the platform you will see that some of these solutions come from heritage professional they come from institutions but they also come from indigenous communities and local communities focusing on indigenous territories rural and urban areas as well as landscape and seascapes and the key very much of this community is to highlight the importance of integrated approaches to heritage protection and management to kickstart this effort of Panorama Nature Culture, we curated 23 solutions focusing on world heritage properties around the world. These solutions, you can access them via the platform and they showcase examples of landscape approaches to heritage management, practices that inter interconnect people, nature and culture and where the recognition of natural and cultural values is fundamental for effective management. Solutions are essentially made of five key components. There is a short summary. You will see an overview of the challenges that the solution is tackling. A, key, a couple of key points on who benefits from these solutions, the importance of solutions benefiting not only heritage, but also having a wider benefit and meeting also societal needs. And then you will see building blocks and building blocks are very much these replicable approaches, partnership and elements that are put in place that can be taken up and uh, updated somewhere else and applied somewhere else. And then finally, there is a section that talks about the impact. It's very important to um, for our solution to be a solution that it actually has an impact, that it actually provide positive development. And by going through the platform, you will see that all solutions tackle these different elements in a different way. I also just very briefly want to show you a couple of the solutions we have. This is, for example, our solution from Yemen on the Socotra Heritage Project. This is a project that focuses on tangible and intangible cultural heritage as a reaction to many, many years of projects that have been implemented on the island where the focus on nature conservation annihilated community from actually being able to interact with the nature component, also bring in their traditional knowledge. And you will see by exploring this solution that 
through different elements such as creating opportunities for capacity building, but also creating availability of also financial resources to include communities in participating in shaping also conservation on the island. There is a process now of moving towards a series of community led activities that tackle both nature and culture. Another interesting experience comes from Rapa Nui, Chile. This is a World Heritage property. And this is a property that up to the inscription almost on the World Heritage list was actually suffering from legislation that were put in place by mainland, by ministries that were on mainland Chile, and they were not very applicable to the Polynesian context of Rapa Nui. And a lot of these different frameworks that have been put in place ended up actually not addressing the needs of the heritage place, both from a nature point of view and so from the ability actually of being able to conserve this very fragile ecosystem, but also to understand, better understand and contextualize archaeological heritage management, understanding also the way in which this ecosystem interacts with archaeological remains. And ultimately, there was a strong disassociation from communities with the heritage of the place and particularly the archaeological heritage of the place. And by reading through this solution, you will get to understand a little bit more the different steps that have been put in place to go from a moment in time where communities were strongly disassociated with their heritage places to a moment in time where in 2017, the Polynesian indigenous community was actually granted park administration. And it's today closely working with the Department of Archaeology and Conservation in managing this incredible heritage place. And we really invite you to have a look at these solutions because it's a great way also to learn from what our colleagues are doing. Shortly bringing you a solution from Italy, this is Porto Venere Cinque Terre and the island. The solution of the Cinque Terre strongly focus on institutional governance. Governance being a very complex matter. As we said early on, the nature culture divide is often found at the institutional level, at the fact that we do have different ministries, different organizations, different administrations that are in charge and have different mandates in terms of nature and culture. And there is often the need to create partnership, to create MOU, and to also establish share organization where this interaction become more viable. And you can read a little bit more about the solution, but this is also an appetizer to tell you that it's not a one-time shot. Solutions can, first of all, they can be revised. This is the reason why we thought an online platform was particularly helpful, because if there are changes, these changes can be revised early on. We can also add more information about this approach, but there is also the chance to connect to different solutions that are implemented at the place. And here is, a, as I said, a short appetizer to the fact that Cinque Terre will also is currently working on a new solution, focusing on climate change adaptation using traditional knowledge and in particularly Stonewall system. Panorama, when talking about impacts, we're not only looking at the impacts that a solution has on the ground, but the platform also and the nature culture community look at also the impact this has on the international framework, specifically understanding how this solution contributes to the achievement of the SDGs or towards the achievement of the AHE targets and anything also in the future that will be a relevant agenda has the potential to be included in, a, in the platform. This is a platform that is fast evolving. We are evolving as time goes by. This is also the reason why working in partnership with many institutions is an added value for us also to better understand cross-sectorally the way in which we can contribute to different international frameworks. Um, just the last part of this, Climate change is, of course, a large focus, but climate change is not something that is tackled by the nature culture thematic community alone or is tackled by a specific thematic community. But looking at solutions in the field of climate change is very much a cross sectoral challenge. And this is also something that we require multidisciplinary cross sectoral solutions. And 
The platform has recently also undergone a discussion on whether it would be better to tackle it as a separate issue with its own community. But the reality is that the solutions that are on the platform from us, nature, culture, to business engagement, to ecosystem-based adaptation, they all have something to say and they all need to say something and to provide good and positive approaches to tackle this global challenges, especially looking at the resilience of places, the resilience of communities, and how we move forward into the future. This is also a plea for all of you to learn a little bit more about the nature culture thematic community. We have been closely following this, um, this conference and we did see a lot of incredibly interesting approaches, but also a lot of incredible work that is being done around the world. And this is very much an invite for many of you to come and join us, share your experiences. It is not just a platform, but this is a very much a live platform, something that we do use in capacity building activities, in capacity development activities. And it's also a very active community when it comes to colleagues that want to get in touch to you, they want to know more about your work. And what we see today is actually that they are communicating very closely between different solutions provider. And there is actually a lot of discussion happening, invites to different conferences to try to understand how different approaches can work in different contexts. And thank you very much. I hope this was interesting to you all and please get in touch with us and um, share your nature culture solutions. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Nicole. Uh, this indeed was very, uh, very interesting and very intriguing uh, to me also. Uh, thanks again for sharing the great work that you and your team are doing on this Panorama project. Uh, in fact, I visited the website and I saw that there are almost more than 350, around 358 solutions which are already posted. Uh, and then, you know, you have categorized them according to the regions, according to themes and uh, in different categories. So again, thank you so much for the great work that you are doing. I had a question to uh, for you. Uh, do you have also, uh, you mind to share any experience of, you know, translating these solutions? um into policy you know working with the government so what challenges did you face if if there are any examples on that also and and uh, what are the, what were the enablers and what were the challenges in in translating you know, the solutions into the policy yes we're not yet at the level of having consolidated data of how this has been transported into policy we are actually working with a couple of country on understanding the policies they have in place one of the solutions you can find on the Panorama platform is actually about uh, policy in Norway, heritage policy in Norway, but we do not have consolidated data yet that say how this has been effectively transported into policy. Nevertheless, this is a platform wide uh, commitment now, especially because we're undergoing a restructuring of the platform to focus more on understanding the impact Panorama has on policy. And our colleagues in the nature sector that have been actually in Panorama for many years, they do have a little bit more hard evidence than us. The one thing maybe to say is that we launched the Panorama Nature Culture Community in October 2020. So this is very much a fresh effort. But what we are hearing is that um, we do have institutions, we do have people from ministries also reaching out, asking a little bit more about solution or asking to be put in touch with solution provider. And we hope really that this crossbreeding brings also to new approaches. The latest example we had is we do have a solutions by Florence on a greenway that has been established. And we were recently contacted by colleagues from the ministry in France asking whether this example could be presented within their own strategic meetings and the solution provider will actually present there. Hopefully we will be able then to report this cross-pollination. Great, great. Um, so thank you again. Um, I'm uh, moving ahead. If we'll have more questions for you, we'll ask you at the end, towards the end of the, the panel. Uh, moving ahead, let me invite our second speaker for today, uh, Mr. Michael uh, Newland. Um, Michael is, a, is the North California Cultural Resources Director for Environmental Science Associates. He serves as, a, uh, as the Climate Change and California Archaeology Committee Chairman 
of the Society for California Archaeology and sits on the Committee on Climate Change Strategies and Archaeological Resources for the Society uh, for uh, American Archaeology. Uh, Michael will be speaking about the climate change and California archaeology. Uh, the floor is yours, Michael. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yes. So thank, oh. so, uh, thank you. And actually, I think this uh, presentation dovetails nicely to a lot of the points that Nicole was making. Um, <clears throat> So uh, yeah, the view from here from California, California is uh, in a lot of ways on the front lines of climate change. Uh, we're having uh, catastrophic fires you may have seen the last couple of years, uh, severe droughts uh, and subsequent landslides. We have floods. We have uh, some severe storms that have come through. And of course, our coastal heritage is at risk from a sea level rise. I want to talk a, a little bit about some of the uh, some of the activities we have going on here in California. <clears throat> um, you know, archaeologists have been looking at climate change for some time, particularly the impacts of climate change on uh, human populations. It's been kind of our uh, field of study for for quite a while, uh, particularly here in California, where we've got desert communities and and a wide range of ecosystems. And it's pretty clear that uh, globally, we're going to lose our national uh, coast or our, our global coast side uh, heritage archaeological resources due to sea level rise and coastal erosion. And for several years now, the Society for California Archaeology has been conducting coastal surveys on a volunteer basis to inventory on the public lands of the California coastline archaeological sites that are going to be lost so they have an idea of uh, of what uh, what our heritage resources are that are threatened and so that we can make policy decisions about uh, about what to do about that <clears throat> excuse me uh, climate change and archaeology in California is is particularly poignant because a lot of the populations here in the past have been subject to climate change uh, effects and just uh, as sort of as an example, this is work from Shwetala and Jones from 2012. Our last big long-term heat spell was about a thousand years ago. And one thing that uh, Shwetala and Jones noted was then looking at uh, human populations throughout central, Northern and Central California, what they saw were large spikes in bone disease from famine malnutrition, fractures, uh, and evidence of violence. And it's worth noting that these were relatively uh, peaceful people before this big uh, climate change event. It's pan-tribal, it's multicultural, it's multi-religious systems in California, different ecosystems, uh, that, that the impact of climate change was, was profound. And it gives us a sense for those of us who live in or work with communities who live hand to mouth due to what's happening with the weather, uh, the evidence, the archaeological evidence for uh, adaptation and response there is pretty, uh, pretty grim. And it's something that uh, we're trying to bring to the forefront here. I, I want to switch gears here just a little bit, <clears throat> uh, you know, given that information. I, you know, I think it's really interesting, really interesting just following on some of the points in the call made. You know, I'm an archaeologist, uh, and I don't do much archaeology anymore. I, I spend most of my time focused on working with uh, indigenous communities, the, the uh, uh, Native California communities and the agencies, to work on a lot of the issues that, that, that Nicole's raising about the differences between how uh, indigenous communities view culture and nature and how they're connected, which is, as you pointed out, very different than from what the, the Western view is. And I want to give a couple examples here. The first uh, is uh, these are smelt. These are some small fish, about six inches long, uh, supposed to be delicious. I haven't, uh, haven't had a chance to try them yet. Um, but they are fished along the coast of California uh, by most of the California coastal tribes. 
And I got an opportunity to work uh, just a, a couple of years ago with the Tolawa, which is a, a group in the northwestern part of California. They still fish for smelt in a traditional manner. Uh, they're out there with the nets and uh, poles pulling a surf smelt up right off the beach there. The men do the fishing. The women uh, arrange the for the drying of the smelt. It's a very traditional uh, practice here of collecting beach grass uh, and, and laying the smelt out. <clears throat> and as I was working with the, with the tribe and talking to the elders, I, I realized that there was a lot that went into harvesting these little fish. And I, I was having a little trouble sort of tracking all of the connections. And so I sat down with <clears throat> some of the tribal folks and had them map out for me all the things that you needed to catch one of these little smelt. Well, as it turns out, it looks like this. Um, and this is, you know, this is a traditional a traditional harvest, you know, pre-contact harvest. But you need the current blossom uh, blooming inland to tell you when the smelt will be running on the coast. So if you were inland and you saw the current blooming, then you would drop everything you were doing and grab your family and head out to the coast to do the smelt fishing. The elders are very knowledgeable about smelt habitat and they look for particle size of the beaches, uh, the, the sand to determine which what parts of the beach are going to be suitable for smelt spawning. And they also are watching the shorebirds to see where the smelt are running along the shore. So they're picking up on these uh, sort of geophysical clues and the local bi biological clues. And then you have the, the this host of transportation gear, basketry and fishing gear requires basketry making tools, which are made out of the elk and the deer bone. It requires obsidian and hunting uh, materials, a lot of which is not available locally, so you have to trade for it. And I want to point out here at the bottom uh, sits ceremony. Ceremony is tied to all these different aspects of smelt fishing. It governs everything that the tribe does. There is no removal of subsistence or any of the activities related to that from ceremony. They are inexorably linked together. <clears throat> um, I think it's worth pointing out here, this is sort of a different version of this, that you could take ceremony out and you could replace it with water. It was sitting in a very similar place. And all the blue circles are ones that are directly affected by water. And for here in California, as I'm sure it is in much of the world, water transcends being just a resource. It is a it is a sacred thing uh, that binds uh, all aspects of your culture and your life together. And so the availability of water, the quality of water uh, affects everything. And the tribes here in California take water management, water conservation, water quality extremely seriously. It's their number one concern. Uh, and if you dig down into it, look at webs like this, you can see how it is connected to everything that occurs here. That has some, uh, that has some other implications as well. I, I want to give a couple more examples here quickly. Um, <clears throat> the first is if we look at species like salmon, uh, salmon is a very important resource towards uh, the for the tribal community. Uh, for most of uh, most of California, except for perhaps the desert tribes, for many of the tribes that I work with, salmon is not just a food resource. They are kin, they're, they're family, and they have a, 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 an obligation, a responsibility embedded within the culture, within their ceremonial system, uh, to attend to and take care of the salmon. For some of the tribes, the salmon gave uh, humans their voice. And so the humans have uh, an obligation to speak on behalf of the salmon to protect them. And so that relationship is not one or not one entirely of subsistence or as a food resource, it's family relationships. And there's responsibilities and authorities that come with that 
that the tribes take extremely seriously. It changes their it ch changes their understanding of how important water is and how important the fish is. <clears throat> I want to take a look at uh, one other piece here. So this is the Sacramento Delta. It's uh, about oh, um, and I even wrote the number down here. I think it's about 3,200 square kilometers. It's the confluence of four major river systems in California. And it, uh, this is the historical boundary. So this is about 18, this is what this looked like in about 1840. And it's filled with uh, tule marsh, salmon habitat. It's a migratory bird uh, nesting uh, area. <clears throat> um, in working with several of the tribes in this area, they not only view this as an important habitat, the delta is a sentient being. The person, the place is a person. And they interact with this place very similarly that they might interact with salmon and that they have a responsibility to it. Um, they have family relations to it. It, it fed them. And they, um, they have a debt of obligation to maintaining the quality of the water that flows through that. And in fact, even have concerns about even restricting the waters through here through levees or channels, because as a living thing, as an, its own entity, it's meant to move and breathe and flow in different directions. Um, <clears throat> this worldview is starting to be uh, addressed and, and looked at by the state government here and the different agencies as they try to understand how do they restore this area to its natural flow, its natural system. And <clears throat> the, the agencies are starting to try to take into account how, what would that mean if this was one thing, one place, a, a living being that we were trying to nurture. Uh, and so uh, I'm, in, I'm involved in a lot of these kinds of discussions between the tribes and the government. Um, we could talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, I wanted to bring these kinds of examples to uh, everybody's attention because I do think it follows along uh, Nicole's points about that divide between cultural and natural it does not really exist within the indigenous communities in California. And with that, I think I will say thank you. Well, uh, well thank you so much, Michael. This was again very interesting. I never thought I mean, uh, this is my first time, you know, uh, uh, to understand the role that archaeology is now playing in 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 in, in finding solutions for uh, the 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 impacts of climate change uh, on on nature and culture both. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Uh, I had a question for you. Um, so there has been an increase, you know, um, conversation between the Native American tribes and California government agencies. Can you tell us what is triggering that increase, you know, uh, conversation? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, there has been. Request others to please uh, mute them. There's been uh, recent legislation here in California that mandates that the state government talk to the tribes about. Uh, and, and look, and the government is obligated to look for places that are important to the tribal communities. So um, for uh, identify those places and take them in into account during the planning process. It is no longer about whether these places have archeological research value or historical value in the broader sense of the community. Mm -hmm. It's whether or not these places have value to the tribe. And it is completely changing the dynamic of how the government interacts with the tribal community, because now the tribes have, in a lot of ways, finally have a voice to express what these places mean to them. And California right now is uh, learning how to protect places in a way that is consistent with tribal values. It's the first time that that's really happened. 
um, it, it is that connection of, oh, you don't write two different sections necessarily of a report, the natural and the cultural section. They're one and they need to be interwoven with each other. If you're going to restore salmon, um, that's an important cultural resource to the tribes. How, what does that restoration look like? Can it be done in a way that's consistent with tribal values? So this is changing very much in California. Um, I'm really excited to see where it's going to go. Um, it's probably what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my career. I'll probably never pick up a shovel again. So uh, thank you. Well, well, thank you again. And, and uh, Nicole actually rightly mentioned that this is such an interesting, important case. So uh, what I asked Nicole uh, uh, in, in after her presentation that whether there are examples of you know, translating these solutions into the policies. And now we have an example of that. So I believe that this the, the new legislation is is based on you know uh, the solutions that uh, mm -hmm. you and your yes. team might have. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly the sorts of stuff that Nicole was talking about. I think we're seeing movement, at least here in the U.S., towards that. And I'm I'm pleased to say that California is sort of out in front of it right now. Great, great. Well, thank you again, Michael. Please be with us. We will have more questions for you towards the end of the uh, end of the panel. And now, let me invite my co-moderator, Eugene Jo, uh, Eugene, uh, uh, to you know carry forward the the discussions and introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Avian. <laughs> thank you. Yes, and uh, thank you very much, Nicole and Michael, for all the wonderful presentations. I was. <laughs> profusely um, taking notes and uh, looking at uh, the wonderful diagrams. Um, so uh, without further ado, we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Therese Sonehag, uh, who's joining us from Sweden. And uh, Therese has been the senior advisor since 2011 at the Swedish National Heritage Board. And she's an architect and specializing in issues concerning climate change and cultural heritage as well as the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030. And uh, today, uh, Teresa is going to be talking about uh, the climate risk assessment of the cultural landscape and the Sami community at, uh, the, at Bartian Sami Summer Gathering in Jämtland, uh, Sweden. So I, I hope I didn't um, mispronounce, well, no. probably didn't no. mispronounce a lot of the names <laughs> there in Swedish, but Teresa, uh, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction and inviting me to this very interesting and urgent uh, session. Uh, yes, as you said, I'm working at the Swedish National Heritage Board, and I will present this uh, case study, Bartian, the Sami summer gathering site in Jämtland, Sweden. And we did a risk assessment of the cultural landscape and the indigenous community within the ADAPT Northern Heritage Project in 2018 to 2019. Uh, this study explains the impacts of climate change on the tangible and intangible heritage of Sami communities. Site managers need to acknowledge the need for a monitoring and strategic plan for the long-term maintenance of cultural heritage sites. And in this case, it is also important to engage younger generations to pass over the traditional knowledge of traditional handcraft like building teepees, storytelling and the spoken language. Knowing the history builds the basis for handling present time and the future. Barchan was a demo site of the Adapt Northern Heritage Project. And Barchan is a site where Tossos and Sami community gather in summer to label reindeer calves. It is a time of festivities when the whole community is gathered. Barchan is a site for recreation, for hunting, fishing, skiing, and enjoy nature and used by visitors and tourists as well. This site has a long history and a mix of buildings. It's called Kota in Swedish or Tipis in English. Uh, traces from ancient herding like storages, foundations of Tipis and modern cottages and huts also. Bachan is situated between the forest and mountains, one and a half hour drive from Östersund and another one hour walk to reach the site. There are no modern installations for water or electricity. The site exposes for changes in seasons. Summer and winter is either longer and hotter, colder or shorter with less snow compared to before 1989, 
and 90, and even before. This can cause shortage in natural springs for water and summer storage for food, pastures and, and biological heritage overgrowth since the reindeer moves to the forest to get away from insects. The maintenance of buildings, renovate the roof and regularly make fire in teepees, is harder to keep up for the owners when the usage of the site changes and bad harvest of local material to renovate the teepees. However, this regular maintenance is one important measure to adapt to climate change. Barjan highlights the situation in general for Sami communities and Sami cultural heritage sites in Sápmi, covering the northern parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia. Climate change affects directly on structures and environments and indirect by change of usage of the site. Climate mitigation measures as wind turbine farms and mines for minerals used in windmills and car batteries also indirectly affects the traditional way of reindeer husbandry, which is a very important business uh, for Sami communities, as well as an intangible heritage and a traditional lifestyle in close relationship to nature and the seasons. You see here the eight seasons of reindeer herding. The reindeer herders act as an early warning system for climate change effects, since they experience the changes on a daily basis. The reindeer react to changes by changing their moving pattern away from insects and away from heat, searching for pastures. Namely, it is the reindeer who decide in a reindeer herders work, the reindeer and the weather. The freeze thawing winters makes it harder for the reindeer to find food, which has forced the herders to support feeding. And this is uh, an article shot up to the left from the news last week. And it's translated to tough times for the reindeer husbandry, climate support are in demand. This is news from this week. An increased interest in land use makes it even harder to maintain the traditional way of husbandry, which climate change effects adds on. A large part of the Sami cultural heritage origins from the reindeer herding. According to the Samis, preserving culturally valuable constructions or landscape are important but impossible to separate from the preservation of all the stories, myths and knowledge that the objects or site carry. Nonetheless, Sami, Sami organizations and other site managers need to acknowledge the need for monitoring and strategically plan for the long-term maintenance of their cultural heritage sites. It is important for managers of cultural heritage sites to start mapping the effects of climate change and develop action plans to manage them. And it has started already. It is also important to engage younger generations. Sami communities pass over their traditional knowledge from generations oral or uh, by learning by doing. Storytelling and the language are important parts of the intangible heritage, which climate change also threatens. For example, words describing weather phenomena and plants that no longer exist. The local history and traditional handcraft building teepees is threatening to disappear without the knowledge of the sites. Knowing the history builds the basis for handling present time and the future. The background to this case study is that the Swedish National Heritage Board initiated the case study as associated partner of this project Adapt More and Heritage as part of the Northern Periphery and Arctic program. The case developed in partnership with Tossos and Sami, Sami community who manage this site and the foundation Galtje representing Southern Samis. The project performed a climate risk assessment of the site by workshops at the site 2018 and 19 and initiated a climate risk management plan. The aim of the case studies of the project uh, was to act as test beds for developing the toolkit that you see here to the right for risk management of cultural heritage and climate change. And there is more information and a climate risk management plan for Barchan also at this link. And 
by this, I say thank you very much for me. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see the Sami um, life patterns, the traditional reindeer herding, um, being in clash with modern day usage of the landscape and how, how that's been affecting um, also the, the way that these uh, traditions are being carried out. Um, I just had a question in the sense, this is a question actually coming from myself. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that the reindeer herders, well, the reindeers actually detect the climate change um, effects much earlier on than we can ever detect them. And that reindeer herders are able to pick up those signs uh, on the seasonal changes. And I'm just wondering how, if, if there is a sort of a foreseen as a mechanism to actually be able to reflect those kind of detections into future land use plans or, or developments in, in the area to see if there are any sort of official ways of being able to utilize that data uh, in the future in a more constructive way. Yes, there are uh, the authority called Sametinget, uh, Samedigi in Sweden, uh, are, they are putting GPS senders on the reindeers. So we have pretty good um, um, knowledge about how they are moving and how the moving patterns are changing. Um, there are no reporting system that is that we have uh, access to, but we have uh, in different projects suggested to do uh, actions where the ranger herders can um, report in with uh, climate uh, change um, impacts information for being accessible for uh, for several people. Yeah, I see. It's very interesting. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. No, um, I would just like to thank all our presenters and uh, all the people who've actually joined us in this session, um, because this is precisely um, the whole point of us talking about it um, in this uh, panel session of, of, clim of climate, culture and peace, where we actually get to talk about the issues of connecting nature and, and cultural knowledge for uh, the better future, really. And uh, all the four different case studies, uh, platforms and initiatives have actually highlighted really a lot of the different issues that are at hand here. I think more and more um, we're acknowledging that the nature culture division is really just a conceptual division. And uh, we say that it's different for indigenous, indigenous communities or for the Western society, but even for Western societies, I think in real life, as we, as we go about when we live our daily uh, lives, the distinction is not actually apparent in our daily lives, but it's actually just more distinct in our way of thought only um, within our heads. And so uh, in this contemporary world, I think it's really, effective to be able to not uh, dwell too much upon the divisions of nature and culture. But uh, we also need to be aware that there are many different cases and practices out there that are already effectively um, addressing this concepts of, of understanding the place as a whole and uh, not necessarily uh, to distinguish between the cultural and natural elements, but actually putting humans into that whole sphere of coexistence within nature and being able to understand all the interrelated connections uh, that we are forming uh, between all the different species, both in the flora and fauna uh, and the overall environment and how our actions can take uh, effect on those uh, in that world. And I especially wanted to highlight Michael's uh, diagram, which was just so intuitive. And I know it, it's, it's an abstract diagram, uh, but it was really effective in showing us all the different interconnections um, of all the different elements that exist in that environment that are connected to be able to maintain that uh, uh, maintain that that particular culture and tradition and those species. Um, I think Dolly's presentation also highlighted the need for us to be much more explicit about the benefits that we can reap from. Uh, protecting our heritage and through that uh, being able to provide benefits for the local communities as well, because um, it's one of the things 
I think that we've not been so, so good at as, as a sector as a whole, because we've been advocating a lot for protecting heritage because it is important. Um, and that in a way has, has lived its life, I think, but we also need to be much more eloquent and more constructive about uh, what are the benefits, what are the unseen benefits and services that these heritage places, uh, these cultural practices are actually giving us, are, are providing us, and uh, be able to actually explicitly express them so that we can strengthen this cause and be able to move forward in terms of reaping a lot more of those benefits. Um, Teresa and uh, Nicole's uh, presentation both highlighted um, the importance also of being able to work with the different communities to really pick up on uh, what works, what doesn't work, and be able to learn from these case studies and be able to apply them and reflect them into policies, uh, strategies, and planning um, instruments in the future, I think, um, so that we can actually have localized place-based actions be planned, established, and implemented in the, uh, in the long run. Um, so we've had some comments coming in and, uh, oh yes, Michael, would you like to contribute? There we go, all right. So uh, yeah, yeah, I was just uh, refer, uh, <clears throat> uh, commenting on uh, Pauline's uh, question about language uh, and heritage. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to point out was that for many of the tribes within California that I've been working with, what is at a place, what is important about a place, what, what the resources it's important to the tribe at the place is embedded in the place name. And the people are named after that place. And so the name and the identity of the people it's, it's, is directly associated to that name with what's there. There's a belonging that, that happens uh, to a location, which is exactly the opposite of what the Western approach has often been, which is to name a place after the person, right? And once that person's gone, that name becomes meaningless. And so if you have some place, and so I'm thinking of the name, uh, there's a, uh, a Kauia Indian uh, name for a, a place that is uh, down in the Mojave Desert. And the name translates to the sound that your foot makes when it hits the sand coming out of the canyon. It's a very, uh, very distinctive sound, a very distinctive, very specific, idea of what that place is uh, and, and who the people are who live there. And <clears throat> when you disconnect place names from the resource, you can change the resource and no one will ever know. Um, if it's named after a person, once that person's gone, that connection between what's there at that place is, is, is vanished and, and becomes irrelevant. And so I think that is one of the, one of the important things uh, for us is, and this is a movement that's happening right now in the U.S. is reestablishing indigenous names to places <clears throat> that were giving, frankly, you know, white people names uh, over the past two centuries, uh, and by reclaiming the, these places and giving and bringing back their the native identity to these places, you're also re-emphasizing what was physically <clears throat> and uh, environmentally important about these places. And so I think that's a very, I think Pauline's question is very astute in that there's a lot, a lot, uh, particularly just in, just in the naming of things um, that ties culture and the natural environment together that we're trying to address. Yes, thank you, Michael, for sharing that. And thank you also, Pauline, for the question. And uh, I just want to add that so, we're also seeing effects of working in international in the international scheme working through designated official languages is actually hindering us rather than enabling us uh, the language issue of always having to translate specific cultural terms um, into either english or french is not deemed um, 
let's say, uh, enough to be able to describe and demonstrate all the different cultural nuances and the traditions um, that are embedded in them. So we're, we're trying to really go through various different exercises to see what different terminologies different cultures actually have to be able to describe different values and different attributes that there that exist as cultural heritage as natural heritage within their uh, places so that there is a better way of understanding them through their language. So, yeah, I think I think that's also a really important point. Um, but thank you very much for this. And uh, thank you very much, Avianz, for for acting as our co moderator for this session. And uh, I would just like to take a moment to thank all the staff members. Um, and all the team um, really making this whole climate culture and peace conference happen. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful platform to be able to exchange and uh, listen to all these presentations. And uh, I believe that we have uh, another day to go tomorrow <laughs> to uh, go on this uh, long journey. And uh, we would like to wish everybody good luck and uh, we'll tune in for other sessions as well. Thank you.